principles in this case. Is that a reason that he is recusing himself? Right now, we don't know that. However, he's fighting very hard not to release the probable cause affidavit, which, you know, I, I know that in huge media capitals uh, of this of this world, of this um, of the United States, like New York, they would the, the press would be fighting so hard where the freedom of information law um, legal document to force the police department, to force the Supreme Court to release all these documents. And I believe even the family of Abby and Libby have a petition out to try to withhold um, the probable cause document from being released. I don't think they're going to be able to do it for that long because the law is on their side. The law is on the side of the press and the law is going to um, eventually force the judge and the courts and the police department to release these documents. Horrible if it could hurt this case if that gets released. But the press is very powerful. And we have, you know, the freedom of the press and they're entitled to certain documents. And they can also, I mean, they're saying that the police have no real good reason to withhold this and that the public has every right to have this document, to see this document, to know what's in this document. And there's no reason it should be withheld. And that's the position of the press. And we're going to see where it goes. Uh, I'm going to play a little of this from the other night. New revelations in the Delphi murders. It's a story we first broke for you on TV and online this morning. IT Mate has obtained court documents that, for the first time, publicly describe the scene where those murders took place. What was taken from the scene and a potential early suspect in the case, IT Mate's Demi Johnson, has been following the story from uh, day one. Demi, this document, very powerful. Yeah, that's right, Phil and Alexis. It's this nine-page request for a search warrant filed March 17th of 2017. Now, that's a little more than a month after Libby German and Abby Williams were found murdered in Delphi. This disturbing document, for the first time, gives us an investigator's description of the crime scene and what the suspect may have taken with him. IT Maid obtained the request for the search warrant from the Murder Sheet podcast, the same group that first published the interview transcript of Anthony Schott's suspect, Kagan Klein. IT Maid has confirmed the document is authentic. The document, written by an FBI agent, describes what investigators found when they discovered the bodies of Abby Williams and Libby German on February 14th. The agent writes, a large amount of blood was lost by the victims at the crime scene. Because of the nature of the victim's wounds, it is nearly certain the perpetrator of the crime would have gotten blood on his person or clothing. Authorities also found that two articles of clothing from one of the girls was missing from the crime scene while the rest of their clothing was recovered. It also appeared the girls... That's um, indicative of uh, many killers, serial killers. They called taking a, an item from the crime scene a souvenir or a trophy and many times um murderers killers serial killers they take a souvenir or a trophy so that they can li relive the thrill of, of of the murder at another time i mean sick sick but that psychologically that's been proven in the study of murderers and serial killers that happens to be a thing believe it or not bodies were moved and staged. The agent goes on to say, based upon my training and experience, it is common for perpetrators of this type of crime to take a souvenir or in some fashion memorialize the crime scene. The agent also references the video on Libby's phone, confirming it was 43 seconds long. Up until now, only a few seconds have... So folks, we're learning some new things uh, just from this very document that the media has received we're learning that um the video was 43 seconds long not the short version that law enforcement and the police released so all of these things are bits of information bits of evidence that the police chose to keep quiet chose to not to share with the public chose to not have out there 
for the families uh, of, of these of Libby and Abby have been made public. It's this short audio clip where you hear the suspect talking to the girls. The agent also confirms the girls were being followed by the suspect on the Monon High Bridge Trail. The agent also says there were no visible signs of a struggle or fight. The search warrant is for the property of Ronald Logan, who owned the land where the two girls were found dead. You see him here in this video shot by Wish TV in 2017, just days after the girls were murdered. It describes his activity the day the girls went missing. The agent says Logan claimed someone drove him to an aquarium store in Lafayette on the afternoon of February 13th at the time the girls disappeared. But the agent says these statements were found to be factually false and intentionally designed to deceive law enforcement officers. The agent says Logan contacted his cousin and asked him to tell that story before the bodies were found. Based on investigators' experience, it is reasonable to believe that the creation of an alibi prior to the discovery of a crime indicates culpability or knowledge of the crime. I asked the founders of the Murder Sheet podcast why they believe this new information is significant. This is a situation where you've had a lot of um, you know, speculation or rumors going around that sounded pretty realistic or perhaps, you know, sounded like well thought out. But it's another thing to sort of see it uh, just in black and white on a, on a court document. I feel it is really important to get actual court documents where people are actually have to swear an oath that what they're saying is actually true. Now, let's tell you a little bit more about Ronald Logan. It's important to note Logan is dead. He died in 2020. He was charged with a probation violation for driving with a suspended license. He was never formally named a suspect and never charged in the Delphi murders. But in this document, the FBI agent says Logan's voice is not inconsistent with that of the person in the video. Now, we showed you that video of Ronald Logan in this story. And in searching through our ar archives, I found this interview with him shortly after the girls were found. Here's what he told us about the day the girls went missing. You know, could it be possible that Ronald Logan was an accomplice to Richard Allen? It seems like law enforcement, uh, he's included, not excluded. And then he dies in uh, 2020. Uh, the only folks that would know if he was, in fact, included rather than excluded, or law enforcement, the FBI. So these are some of the things that they have chosen to keep close to the vest, to keep quiet, and it's sort of being revealed now by, by the media. Monday afternoon, I was in Lafayette Aquarium World getting a tropical fish from my aquarium. So when I came home, uh, one of the neighbors stopped and asked permission to come back here and look for the missing girls, and that's the first time I knew anything about it. So I fooled with my tropical fish the whole time that the search was going on Monday night, but then they didn't find him until Tuesday at around noon or one or whatever it was. Stunning new details. I mean, I know you reached out to the girls' family. They had no comment. But what about state police and the FBI? So I did just receive a statement from state police superintendent Doug Carter. He tells me, I would like to remind the public that this is an active and ongoing investigation and we will do everything we can to protect its integrity and to not try it in court of public opinion. We cannot publicly convict someone based on a single document which was not released by investigators. Our profession will not allow us to speak on what we think, but to always speak about what we know. This is especially important with the heinous murders of Abby and Libby. We must continue to be mindful of their surviving family members and the entire Carroll County community who are affected by this investigation. Now, the FBI also sent a statement saying it does not have any more details to share at this time. Okay, you'll stay on top of it as you have been for the past few years. Demi, thank you very much. Uh, Ronald Logan, yeah, he's now the second person that we know police searched and questioned in the case. Demi and I, Team A, first told you about another person, Kagan Klein, back in December of 2021. He's the man in jail right now accused of creating and using the Anthony Schatz profile to get hundreds of sexual pictures and videos from underage girls. That's the same account state police said that they found while investigating the Delphi murders then in March. 
with the help of the Murder Sheet podcast, we were able to tell you about Klein's interview transcript with police. It revealed the Anthony Schatz profile did communicate with the girls the day that they were killed. Now, if you missed any part of this story, we've posted the documents online at wishtv.com. Just grab your phone, scan the QR code on that screen. That will take you to our website and click on the As Seen on Wish TV section. Eight at five starts now. We begin at five o'clock with stunning new revelations in the Delphi. It's a story we first wrote for you on TV. Folks, oh, sorry, I'm having a little technical. There we go. So you can see there is a lot of different evidence in this case. And the web that it lays is probably a big and large and complicated one. However, I think it was very clear from the Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter that he didn't wish to communicate with the press or to give this information out. So as, as much as the press wants to put this information out there as, you know, we're the first, we're the first to uncover this, it's not going to help the case. In fact, it's going to hurt the case and it's going to hurt the families of Abby and Libby. And that's one of the biggest reasons um, why they don't want this out. But however, however, the law is probably on the side of the press. And they're eventually, and my, I predict, they're going to get this all of this stuff released. It's going to take time. And if law enforcement can stall them from getting it, they'll have done their job. And um, that's what I believe their goal is during this the Delphi murders case. Less than 30 minutes ago, we learned the judge in this case has recused himself. So this means he is stepping down from being the judge in the case. This comes after he made statements saying that he felt unsafe. Karen Campbell joins us now to explain that and what happened with Richard Allen as well. Yeah, well, Allen County Judge Fran Gall will now take over as the special judge in the Delphi murder case against Richard Allen. Now, we've learned a judge does not have to give a specific reason for recusing from a case. It Folks, unusual. Unusual that um, I find that a judge wouldn't want to try this case. This would probably be the biggest case of Judge Benjamin Diener's lifetime. And he must have a pretty darn good reason to recuse himself. I mean, saying that his life is in danger, his family's in danger. I mean, th this, again, is could probably be the case of a lifetime, and he's looking to step away from it. And this uh, court order released today, Circuit Court, ben, Circuit Court Judge, rather, Benjamin Diener says some members of the public have shared content about his family on YouTube, including some family photos. Now, Diener reportedly asked state court administrators for help dealing with what he called a brewing storm of requests from the public to release case information on Richard Allen, the man charged in the Delphi murders of Abby Williams and Libby German. Now, Judge Diener goes on to write, quote, the public's bloodlust for information before it exists is extremely dangerous. All public servants administering this action do not feel safe and are not protected. He explains the court has 30 days to rule on any motion, but that he was given seven days or one day when hand delivered to respond to a FOIA request or face litigation. Now, he says all public information in this case will be available once it exists. And today we also learned of a request to move Richard Allen to a state prison. Uh, we also learned in less than about 10 minutes ago, he was officially transferred to a state prison. The court says it is for Allen's safekeeping as he waits to go to trial. That request claims that he is in imminent danger of getting seriously hurt or killed. Now, we want to mention that a FOIA request, that's simply a freedom of information request. Media or the public for information that is supposed to be public. Now, Judge Diener says Richard Allen is innocent until proven guilty. And Scott and Ann, we also just learned this. A member of the German family tweeted that they would like to keep the court documents sealed. And we know there is an upcoming public hearing this month on if the judge will keep Allen's case information sealed or not. So, folks, you, you heard it there. Um, again, the, the judge uh, has chosen to recuse himself. What might be his reasons to recuse himself? Is it his own personal safety? Is it um, 
that he knows people involved in this case that are too close to him. As I said earlier on, this case would probably be the case of a lifetime for any judge, for any attorney, for any prosecutor. Um, for him to step away from this. It was interesting that he said um, the freedom of information law and the bloodlust of the public is not the reason to release uh, information. And that he said that once the information is available, he will certainly release it. Now, as I said earlier, in a large city, say like New York, that has the press is all so powerful, you know, the New York Times, you have Post, Daily News, all the TV stations, they would be right on this case with a, a legal document, a freedom of information law, and they would be uh, they would be all over this. And they would file that brief. And they, I believe the police and the, the courts would be forced to release a lot of the information. Um, folks, for those of you that aren't familiar with the legal process, there's something called discovery. And discovery is all of the information that the prosecution has. It must release to the defense. However, one of the things that the law does not cover is when does the prosecution have to release it to the defense? Sometimes strategy in the, on the part of the prosecution, they will purposely withhold the evidentiary information until right before the trial is going to start. And the day the trial starts, they show up with two boxes of evidentiary material. And invariably, the defense counsel will say, Your Honor, Obviously, I cannot read this in 24 hours and be ready for trial tomorrow. I request a stay. I'm going to need at least a month to go through all this stuff. And invariably, the judge gives the defense counsel that amount of time because he recognizes that that amount of evidence, that amount of documents would be impossible to read in that amount of time. One of the things that it seems that the press always wants to know, they want to know the how of these two murders. We still don't know the how, and the press doesn't know the how. What we do know is, just released in these documents, is that it was a very bloody crime scene. Very bloody. That hasn't really come out till these documents were just released. So it's... Um, it's very important now that they get this information for the press because they, they got to tell their story. You know, they got to tell the story to the public. Although, does the public really, really need to know this? Well, no, but I guess if you're a newspaper or you know, if you're a, a TV station, uh, you want this information released. And um, that's that's what they're... That's why they're going to be filing their freedom of information law briefs. Indiana say the families of 13-year-old Abby Williams and 14-year-old Libby German are one step closer to justice tonight. Today, officials confirmed that 50-year-old Richard Allen has been arrested and charged with two counts of murder. The two teenage girls disappeared during a hiking trip in Delphi, their hometown, back in 2017. Now, police say Allen also called Delphi his home, lending credence to the thought that the girl's alleged killer was hiding in plain sight. Also today, Libby German's grandmother, Becky Patty, said that Allen once processed film for her family at a local CDS store and did not charge the loved one who picked the photographs up. Now, Patty didn't elaborate on that chilling encounter, but she did describe how she feels now that a suspect is finally in police custody. I don't feel like I thought I would. I've always said that I would be screaming on the rooftops a bit or not. It's, it's sad. Um, while there's somebody that's been arrested, there is, you know, our, our lives, our lives for five and a half years have been in a search, search mode. And you can almost hear how exhausted Libby German's grandmother feels. And that exhaustion makes sense, considering all that she and everyone in the small city of Delphi have gone through for so many years.
Todd Dykes, WWT News 5. So, Todd, as you mentioned, they've been following this. So America has and even the world. Uh, what else can you talk to us about concerning the arrest of Richard Allen? Yeah, very little at this point, Mike. And uh, that's raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, that's because of a move the prosecutor in this case described as unusual. The prosecutor, Nicholas uh, McClellan, saying in order to maintain the integrity of the investigation, and he says it's still ongoing, a judge agreed to place the charging document and information about probable cause under seal. That means that specific details about Allen's arrest are off limits, even to the families of the two teens who were killed. So yeah. a lot of questions tonight, Mike and Shree, but we'll just have to wait. Right. Hopefully we'll get the answers in time. And I know so many people, when you're watching that news conference, you want everything answered. And so often that just doesn't happen. And that was the case today. Yeah, I agree. Right. Take Todd, time. Thanks. Todd, thanks so much. Well, breaking tonight. So folks, you can see, I mean, how much the press wants that information released. They want it out there. You know, is it going to help anyone? Uh, to know, you know, and I've repeated a million times for folks that aren't in the law enforcement or the law, you know, we use the term probable cause and probable cause is the level of suspicion necessary to place someone under arrest. That doesn't mean they did it. That doesn't mean they will be convicted. That means the definition of probable cause is facts and circumstances that would allow a reasonable person to believe that a crime has been committed and the person arrested committed the crime. Not the highest standard on this earth, right? But that is what that is the definition word for word of what probable cause is. So I don't want to assume that everyone knows what probable cause is. The other thing would probably be a, a legal information or an indictment. And one of the reasons the police and the prosecutor doesn't want that out is because both in the probable cause um, affidavit uh, or warrant and in the uh, legal information or the indictment, certain specifics of the crime have to be noted. You know, you, if, if there's two there's two counts of murder, second degree uh they would have to talk about how the murder was committed in that legal information. And that's the very information that, um, that they don't want out there. And BB2, Sergeant Bill, would the probable cause identify DNA was used for the arrest? Potentially it could. It could uh, spell out that the, um, the suspect, the defendant, Richard Allen, that his DNA was found in the crime scene or on the bodies of the girls or on the clothing of the girls. So yes, it could say that. Does the prosecution want that out there right now? Uh, the answer is no, they do not. They do not want that out there. So these are the reasons that the police and the prosecution wants to keep this close to the vest. And those are the reasons you heard the judge or you, you read the document that judge said, the public has this bloodlust to want to know all the factors in regards to the murders of Abby and Libby. A bloodlust, he called it. Is that what the media is? Is, is that they want to put... Why do they want this information so badly? Is it to educate their, um, their audience? Or is it to increase their ratings. So, you know, I, I know being cynical about this, but that is why. And again, law enforcement doesn't want this out there right now. And the prosecution doesn't want this out there now. And apparently right now the judge agrees that the judge doesn't want that out there now. The judge doesn't want it so bad that he's holding, withholding it. And he's actually recusing himself. You saw that. So Judge Benjamin Diener now has pulled himself off the case and a, a Judge Fran Gull of Allen County, she's going to pick up this case. And as I said earlier, this would be a case that almost, you know, any judge um, in his career, in her career, would want a case like this, a high-profile case, a case where 
the judge's skills, the judge's professionalism, the judge's notoriety as, as a person of jurisprudence, they would want a case like this. So there must be a huge and very good reason why Judge Benjamin Diener is recusing himself in this case. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, real crime stories. If you like real crime podcast from a police perspective, from a police point of view, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up, ring that bell. And if you want to support us, we have a Patreon with three different levels, and you can support us on our Patreon. And we also have a YouTube channel with, count them, five different levels. And you see the folks with the green font in the chat. They're the members of our YouTube family, and we really appreciate what they do for our channel and in, in, support, in supporting us. This case has the notoriety of this case is not only in the United States. It's across the world, across the globe. It's been dissected by many different people, law enforcement experts from all over the world. And it's, um, it's, it's an amazing case, really. The horror of it, though, with 13 and 14-year-old girls, and it took five and a half years to solve this case. Five and a half years. The girls were 13 and 14 at the time. They would be 18 and a half and 19 and a half if they were alive. Their lives were taken from them. They didn't get to go to their junior prom or their senior prom or apply to college. They didn't get to play sports in school. They didn't get to have a boyfriend, you know. Charisma, thank you for the $5 super chat. Thanks, Bill. Love your show. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all the support we get from our fans from all over all over the world, all over the United States, all over uh, British Columbia, Great Britain, Australia, South Africa. I want to thank all you folks. You know, there's a lot of questions that have been asked in regards to this case. Um, the top arrest questions that are asked, I'm going to go over a few of them because it's um, people want to know uh, – a lot of questions about Richard Allen. And there's so many questions, again, that are going to be answered um, once the case moves forward in the court of law. But for right now, we have to wait till it moves forward. And frankly, the world has been absolutely rocked by the news of the arrest of Richard Allen. By this point, we all know the Delphi murders case pretty well, unfortunately. The bodies of Abigail Williams and Liberty German were found near an abandoned railroad track in 2017. But for years, authorities have remained really tight-lipped on the facts surrounding this case. To this day, we still don't know how Abby and Libby were killed. We don't know how their bodies were found. The biggest pieces of information, at least since 2017, really came during a 2019 press conference when police released new suspect photos and addressed the person they thought killed Abby and Libby directly, who came to be known as bridge guy. So now that there's an arrest, almost six years after these really terrible murders, for the first time, we're seeing the face of someone police believe is responsible for these crimes, Richard M. Allen. There are still so many questions regarding decisions that have been made by authorities on different aspects of these new developments that have unfolded since the arrest of Richard Allen. So we're going to try and answer some of those right now. The biggest questions we've gotten recently surrounding this entire situation is why we, as a news station, are pushing for the probable cause affidavit to be made public in this case. The probable cause and the charging information has been sealed by the court. Probable cause is a requirement found in the Fourth Amendment, and it has to be met before police make an arrest or before they conduct a search warrant. We get and request probable cause affidavits as journalists all the time. Time. And they're crucial because not only do they lay out why an arrest was made and give insight into why a person in our community no longer walks among us as a free person, but they're public documents. So it's transparent why police are taking a person into custody. But a judge sealed the probable cause affidavit for the arrest of Richard Allen. And it's a really rare move that officials would charge someone with two counts of murder in such a high profile case 
without releasing the reason why. It's something a lot of experts didn't anticipate. I can't think of ever hearing of a probable cause affidavit being held 30 days after an arrest was made. Another big question we've been getting is what happened to the judge in this case? On November 3rd, we we reported Carroll County Judge Benjamin Diener had recused himself from the Delphi murders case. In his order, Diener said he has determined that the particular circumstances within the underlying case warrant recusal and dictate that a special judge be appointed in this case. Another question we got, why is everyone saying Richard Allen was charged with murder? Is he innocent until he's proven guilty? Well, under U.S. law, Allen is innocent until proven guilty. It's a crucial part of due process. You know, I don't know what she's talking about. You know, being charged and being convicted are two different things. Yes, he's innocent to proven guilty, but he still gets charged. You know, the arrest, probable cause, the, the whole criminal justice process starts with the arrest, all right? And in many jurisdictions, it then, the case goes to a grand jury. A grand jury and will indict the defendant or not, but they indict the defendant. If the, they come down with what's known as a true bill, then the case proceeds. If they fail to indict the uh, defendant and they don't come down with a true bill, the case is over. However, in, a, in, in most jurisdictions, a grand jury will indict the person, but no one says that the person is guilty after that. The, 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 the trial proceeds, and I don't know what this media person is saying that, uh, well, why should he be getting charged? Well, that's how it always works. The 14th Amendment states no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That usually refers to fair procedures, but Allen's been charged with two counts of murder, and he has been arrested, but he hasn't been convicted. Another question. Do police think Richard Allen is the man who committed the murders? Yes, he is charged with two counts of murder and has been arrested. Again, the probable cause hasn't been released, so we don't know specifically why. But Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter also told our reporter Emily Longnecker that straight up when she asked him a similar question. Are you confident this is your guy? The judge signed the probable cause affidavit for the arrest of Richard Allen for two counts of murder. Yes. Do you think there are other people involved? I'm not going to go there. Our final most asked question, will Allen's trial be televised? No, it will not. A rule in the Indiana Code of Judicial Conduct, Rule 2.17, prohibits judges from allowing court proceedings to be broadcast. Interestingly enough though, a pilot program that launched in November 2021 allowed five counties in Indiana to broadcast court proceedings. Judges were at their discretion if they wanted to allow them to be broadcast or not, and Allen County was one of the counties involved in that project. Remember, Allen County's where Special Judge Fran Gall, who's now being called on to hear Richard Allen's case, was pulled from. At this point, we don't know if the actual case will be heard in Allen County, but it's interesting to think about how that pilot project could have possibly impacted Allen's trial if it hadn't stopped on March 31st of this year. Of course, the situation is one that will continue to unfold. If you have any ongoing questions, please leave a comment. We'll answer it as best we can. We'll also be streaming an in-depth special on Saturday, which will hopefully answer some of these questions on this horrific case. You know, it, as you can tell, the media is really beside themselves that they have not been allowed to get some of the evidentiary information, um, the evidentiary information that's available in this case that the judge has sealed. They are freaking out. <laughs> Bluntly, they are freaking out. And I'm sure they've got all their attorneys trying to slap freedom of information law affidavits on to force the court to do that. But the judge is the, the arbiter of this. He decides whether or not uh, information like that gets released. Does it get released? When it gets released? You know, I spoke earlier about discovery and when evidentiary material gets given to the other side gets given to the defense. So Richard Allen's defense attorney, when will he or she, or well, they could have several attorneys, when will they be receiving the evidentiary material, the, the discovery material, so that they can prepare for their case? What is the evidentiary material? Obviously, 
they mentioned in those affidavits, two articles of clothing were removed from the crime scene. Did they recover that from Richard Allen's home? Murderers, killers take souvenirs. They call them trophies so they can relive the murder, relive the event, sickness, right? Um, they also mentioned that the crime scene was staged. That usually is a psychosexual thing that a killer does to stage a crime scene to make it look different than it, it obviously was or, or to make the crime scene appear differently than the killer intended. Catherine Mooney, DNA testing. Uh, Richard Allen, <clears throat> because of what, he, what he's been arrested for, he can be compelled to give his DNA. The judge just signs an order. They take his DNA from him. But um, taking DNA from a defendant is not that intrusive. All The way they take DNA now is they take a cotton swab. You swab the inside of their mouth for cells from their cheek. You put it into a paper envelope. You seal it. Sign your, uh, the detective would sign his name and shield number across the flap. And they would test the DNA. And uh, he would not have a choice as to refuse to give his DNA. The judge would order him to do so, and he would have to do it. So what other evidence on search warrants have they recovered? We don't know that either. And of course, the press is dying, dying, dying to know that. They're dying to know what is the evidence. You saw when Doug Carter was asked uh, by the press, oh, what, what kind of evidence you have? He goes, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not willing to talk about that. I'm not giving that up. They kept everything so close to the vest. You think he's going to tell the press the evidence they have? Who? What other people or peoples, defendants, suspects, are implicated in this case? Are there others? Potentially, there are. You know, where does the trail lead? Um, do they have? Do we? Do we know for sure they have DNA evidence? We do not know for sure. Um, we do not know for sure that they have DNA. I would I say they, they, they probably do. Uh, but do we know for sure that they have DNA evidence? I don't think uh, um, we know for sure that they have DNA evidence. But look, this case was five and a half years old. Five and a half years old. And um, un unbelievable that uh, it's solved. Well, we can't say it's solved that there's been an arrest in this five and a half years later. And it's just, see that man on the screen right now, Doug Carter, the Indiana uh, State Police uh, Superintendent. Tremendous job, uh, tremendous man. Uh, it's, it's just an incredible, um, it's an incredible job they did. And, and the investigators working uh, working tirelessly five and a half years, bringing this case home with them. Uh, you know, it just, it just is, sure it is incredible life. the amount of work. Um, and just thinking, I mean, I know a lot of you folks haven't done work like this, but the frustration involved and i'm sure they were being second guessed third guessed and people saying oh my god you got videotape how come you can't find the person or persons that did this how easy how much easier can this be you know and the the answer is uh it, it's not easy and as you could see five and a half years went by they just arrested somebody guess what the investigators understand that the case is nowhere near finished. It's nowhere near finished. They've just got to keep going. It's, it's, this case is not over by any stretch of the imagination. You know, uh, we talked about life going on and the, uh, the trials and tribulations for investigators. You know, in your own family, kids are born, right? Kids go to school, kids go to college, people die in your family. Life goes on. 
and life goes on for these investigators. But other than inside their own life, this is the biggest thing. This is the biggest thing in their life, and they take it home with them. Uh, and it's that's the nature of homicide investigation. And this case was a heinous case from minute one. Two th girls, 13 and 14 years old, from the Delphi, Delphi community, going to a park, innocent little girls, and wind up viciously murdered by some, you know, let's call him what he is, some dirtbag, you know, who somehow flew under the radar and was never arrested. You know, he had minor things like speeding ticket or traffic violations, but he never arrested before, but graduates his first crime to a double murder of two little girls, you know. Can we explain that? And here's this guy, you know, I hate to think of even the psychosexual nature of this case, but it screams it out. It screams it, especially in the taking of souvenirs and of trophies, as they say, from the crime scene, of staging the crime scene, of seeing who this guy is, this little dirtbag works at a drugstore, you know. Um, it screams that out. And uh, I just, uh, you know, this is when you look at the police, in, in my mind, I look at the police as heroes. And I know the, the police aren't looked upon by everyone as heroes, but in my mind, they are. Folks, if you're looking for an attorney in a New York City metropolitan area, Joe Murray is your man. A retired NYPD police officer, Joe is a top defense attorney in the New York City metropolitan area. You can reach Joe on his cell phone at 718 514 3855. You can email him at joe at jmurray law.com. His website is jmurray law.com. Joe is one of the biggest supporters we have of Police Off the Cuff podcast, and uh, he's been supporting us for years now. Joe, thank you so much. And again, great defense attorney in the New York metropolitan area. So where's the case going to go from here? Where does it go? Where does it go from here? You know, what, what are we looking at now? And we're looking at, you know, it's going to be a huge case. You know, they want, of course, they're already talking about, uh, about cameras in the courtroom. Would this be a good case for cameras in the courtroom? You know, does cameras in the courtroom prejudice the case? Does it make stars out of the prosecution and the defense? Does it make people play to the cameras? Isn't it better off that they just play to the jury the way they're supposed to, instead of playing to the cameras, which happens lots of times. So I'm not a big uh, endorser of cameras in the courtroom. Um, in fact, uh, I'm pretty much against it. I, we've seen it in other cases. A killer on camera. Still, the days turn to weeks weeks into months months to years no answers now the moment their families and this community have been waiting for from a sketch in every corner of town now there is a name the judge for all cause of the for the arrest of your town for two counts of murder and a face to the man accused of killing abby and Lynn. A man, I mean, police say, has walked among them all these years. Lived here and, and was in, in the community and, and ran around like there's no law, you know? And it's kind of slap in the face. That's why we said it never stopped searching anywhere. So you could be looking right amongst us, hiding in plain sight. Abby and Libby, their fantasies, which is owed. Abby and Libby, their families in this community. It's uh, somewhat bittersweet, you know, knowing that uh, while it allows us to move to the next turn or the next chapter, uh, we still have got. You know, Judith Lyons, uh, people were terrified because the first thought was that it might have been a serial killer. It was chilling. You know, Judith, he has all the traits of a serial killer. I wouldn't be surprised that he has other bodies on him, this guy, because he has many of the traits of a serial killer. 
got a big, we, now we got a big mountain ahead of us, and, and we're going to stay after it. I've never give, we haven't ever given up, and, and you guys haven't given up on us. We're going to keep pushing all the way. Abby and Lee, going death, have had a profound effect on so many of us. Thanks for joining us for our special on the Delphi murder arrest. Over the next 30 minutes now, we're going to be sharing an in-depth interview about the case with Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter. We'll also hear from the girls' families about the arrest and why they feel this isn't the end, but the beginning of justice for these girls. But first, how we got to this point. It all started on February 13th, 2017, when two young girls went out for a walk and never came home. The next day, Valentine's Day, a grim discovery. The girls' bodies discovered in a wooded area near the bridge where they had gone the day before for a simple afternoon hike. It was on the 15th that police revealed evidence captured on one of the girls' phones, showing their suspected killer, the man in blue jacket. Three days later, Abby and Libby were laid to rest, a community in mourning and a community in fear. February 22nd is when we heard their alleged killer's voice for the first time. Down the hill. Down the hill. With the infamous Down the Hill recording. It wasn't until July that we got our first look at their alleged killer when this sketch was released. His image, everywhere you looked in the small town of Delphi and beyond. Was Hiller caught on camera, two teenage girls found dead. That September, the girls' families took their plea for answers national by appearing on Dr. Phil. Still nothing, as the case seemed to grow cold. Fast forward to April 22nd of 2019. That's when Indiana State Police released this updated sketch of Abby and Libby. You know, folks, P uh, the police hate to hear that term, the case went cold, you know, because they never stopped working on this. I think the first year they got 30,000 tips and followed up on all of, every single one of them. So when they hear that term, the case went cold, that's another media. The media talks so much shit, you know? And I, I mean, I when I look at this and I see that they went on Dr. Phil, well, how, I mean, it's a national audience, but, you know, but Dr. Phil knows nothing about anything, you know? And it's like, Yes, they went on his show. He's got a national audience, and it's good to keep it out there. And that's one of the best reasons to keep it out there in the media is because of the national attention. And the, another thing is more powerful than that TV that comes into everyone's living room. The amount of people it can apprise of information is unbelievable. But, you know, at the same time, there's bad things about the media also. He's alleged killer, a far different look from the original sketch. Investigators also released additional audio of the suspected killer. Nearly another year passes with no new leads until December of 2021. That's when police announce a possible break, a fake social media account that communicated with Libby shortly before her death. Investigators did track down that man, and he denied any involvement and has never been charged in the case. That all leads us to October 26th, the day police arrested 50-year-old Richard Allen. He was formally charged two days later with murder in the girls' deaths. And on October 31st, the news the family and community have been waiting for for nearly six years. An official announcement of the arrest and the murders and new hope for justice for Abby and Libby. That announcement coming from the Indiana State Police Superintendent. Our senior investigative reporter Bob Siegel sat down with Doug Carter and they talked about the scale of this investigation, the evidence that's still secret from the public, and the unexpected reaction following this arrest. Today is not a day to celebrate, but the arrest of Richard M. Allen of Delphi on two counts of murder is sure a major step in leading to the conclusion of this long-term and complex investigation. Announcing an arrest in one of the most notorious murder cases in state history, that job belonged to Doug Carter, superintendent of Indiana State Police. 
After years of working with investigators, Carter told me he had dreamed this announcement would come, but the arrest of Richard Allen was not exactly how Carter had imagined it. What went through your mind when you learned that he was in custody? Empty. I felt pretty empty. It wasn't what I anticipated it to be, Bob. I was, um, it was a bit overwhelming, quite frankly, at least initially. And it caused me to, to really go back in time and try to understand the magnitude of what's just happened. You know, folks, they had all over their squad rooms, all over where the police were, today's the day. And what that stood for was the fact that today's the day we're going to lock up the guy or person or persons that killed Abby and Libby. And it was almost like a rallying cry, today's the day. When you spoke to Abby and Libby's families, how did they respond? They didn't really know what to say. And it was, it was that feeling of after all of these years, um, we, we heard what we wanted to hear, now what? How are we supposed to feel? I think they were pleased because remember, um, we don't tell the family much more than, than, than the rest of the world knows. We can't. So they had the same questions that everyone else has. There are lots of questions because the Carroll County prosecutor filed a request at the courthouse to keep records in the murder case sealed. That includes the probable cause affidavit, a document that would help explain why police believe Richard Allen committed the murders of two teenagers. And that document is almost always made public once a defendant is arrested. Why is information in this case, why is the probable cause affidavit not released right now? Once the prosecutor made the decision to do that and the judge signed that document, it took it completely out of our hands. I believe in the probable cause. I've read it multiple times. I believe in that probable cause. I believe in its outcome. So I think in, in, um, in some uh, semblance of, sh of a short period of time, will be up to the judge, of course, up to the courts. They will release that probable cause affidavit. I understand the question, and that answer will come in due time. Was there a request by Indiana State Police to no, keep no. it sealed? No, not that I'm aware of. Do you support keeping it sealed, or do you believe that it should be released? I think it should point? be released, but I also think there's value in a period of time to keep it sealed. Uh, again, in time, uh, the, the strategy will be clear. 13 News asked the state police superintendent if he believes anyone else participated in the murders and if another arrest in the case might be coming. Do you anticipate there could be other arrests in this case? There always could be other arrests with any case. It depends on what we learn. He, You know, I, I don't think those are the exact questions. I think that Doug Carter uh, doesn't want to answer uh, because... Yeah, could there be other arrests? Yeah, there could always be other arrests. But if he asked them, are there going to be other arrests? I don't think he would be willing to answer that question. Because, again, that would be uh, showing their hand and showing that they have more, you know, there are potentially more perpetrators in this case, which I believe there probably are. There probably are. But maybe, just maybe, they don't have the nexus in order to make an arrest of multiple defendants in this case. There very well uh, could be uh, more defendants. We'll just have to wait and see. But the uh, Superintendent Carter is being very cool in the way he answers these questions. He's doing quite a, great, a good job. He did not directly answer either of those questions. And he also chose his words very carefully when I asked about this video on the Monon High Bridge. Police say Libby German secretly took the video on her cell phone on the day of the murders, and the video also captured a man's voice. Indiana State Police said this man was a person of interest, a prime suspect in the murders of Abby and Libby. Is Richard Allen the man who was captured in that video? That answer will be, will be known sometime in the near future. While Carter won't talk right now about the evidence, he is very confident that police have identified the killer. He has not spoken directly to Richard Allen since his arrest, but he did speak to him indirectly at a press conference nearly six years ago, just days after police found the victim's bodies in these woods. Somebody knows. And if you're watching...
we'll find you. Did you find that person? We did. We did. You know, folks, it's so, so amazing. Like, cops are the same all over the world. You know, I would say all over the United States, but it's actually all over the world. They're the same. There's certain traits. There's certain things you talk about. And there's certain ways you act during a, a, a moment of exaltation, of triumph, after a really difficult investigation like this. You know, did you get this guy? Did you get the guy? Yeah, we did. So he, he's saying that knowing the evidence they have against this guy. And he knows the case they're going to present against this guy. And he's confident that they have the right guy. So when a man like Doug Carter says that, I'm confident that they have the right guy, you know. And it's I think it's good that um, people in the community understand that there are police executives like this that came up through the ranks and uh, are representing them and defending them and protecting them and working tirelessly to bring someone to justice. Evil. He said in a couple of the press conferences, we will not let evil persevere. I thought that was so profound that he said that, that we are the good guys. We're going to conquer evil. And we're going to make sure that we get evil. And even in the press conferences, when he before they knew who Richard Allen was, and he spoke directly to the killer, you're out there, and we're going to get you. We're going to find you. And we know you're out there. And just realize we will never stop looking for you. You know, you think Richard Allen watched a couple of the press conferences? Absolutely. You know, I used to speak about um, when we would have a homicide in New York City and uh, around the crime scene, there'd be hundreds, hundreds of people on the street. And I used to sometimes take pictures of the crowd. And people would be like, what are you doing that for? Well, because potentially the killer's in the crowd. And if the killer's not in the crowd, guess who is in the crowd? People that know who the killer is. Witnesses. So later on, when we pull people in, they said, oh, I was, I was in New Jersey. And you go, oh, really? Here you are in this picture from 15 minutes ago. I don't think you were in New Jersey. I think you were on the street. So all of those things are little tricks we learn in the homicide business. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. If you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, uh, give us the thumbs up, ring that bell. And again, if uh, you want to support us, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And we also have a YouTube channel memberships with five different levels. And all you folks have, who have been asking... The Supreme Command, the mugs are in. So if you want a Supreme Command, the mug, you can order them now. They are in. They're available. So now you can stop asking me. They're in. The Supreme Command, the mugs are in. So you can you can get them on our merch site. Still ahead, the conversation continues with State Police Superintendent Doug Carter, including how many investigators it took to crack this case. I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. And the important detour he took on his way to announce an arrest in the Delphi murders. We'll tell you where he went. That many individuals participate from an investigative standpoint? Bob, I'm up in, in, a, in a year and a half or so, I'll finish my 40th year. I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. I think one of the reasons is because it's captured the attention of the world because it's every town USA. It's every town USA. It's your daughter and it's mine. It's her friend and it's my daughter's friend. 
I think that's one of the reasons that has captured the attention of really the globe. But there are other unsolved homicides, asides in Indiana, in small towns very similar to Delphi, some involving children even younger than Abby and Libby, cases that have received far less attention than this one. Following an arrest in Delphi, Carter said those cases are also very much on his mind, and he mentioned one in particular. I want to talk about Flora. He's talking about a deadly house fire in the town of Flora, just 10 miles from the murder scene in Delphi. The fire happened six years ago inside this house, trapping four young sisters who all died. Investigators say the fire was arson. The deaths are homicides. On the day of this press conference to announce an arrest in the Delphi murder case, Doug Carter said this is where he came first, is it this crime scene, scene, which is also still under investigation by Indiana State Police. I sat across the street in that crowd a lot and looked at that house. It has the same exact remnants of a fire that we saw now almost six years ago this month. Boarded windows and, and, and black soot on the outside. And it just broke my heart that it was still there because I hadn't seen it in some time. The cases are, the, the investigations are very different, but the tragic outcome is the same when there's loss of life. And um, I, I hope that one day we can do the same thing. But we have. You know, folks, here's a guy, 40 years in law enforcement, 40 years. On the NYPD, you have to retire at the age of 63. Uh, they don't let you uh, work longer than that. So I'm, I would imagine he must be past the age of 63. I don't know if that's the same rules in the Indiana State Police, but he is a superstar, you know, great. I mean, he gives the impression of strength, of confidence, uh, confidence, competence also. And he's the guy that you want taking responsibility for a case like this. And he's the guy that you want up at the microphone explaining to the public, the community, and the press what's going on. I have to hear from people. And I hope that one day we State police said they have not gotten not gotten many tips on who set the fire that killed these girls. But tips continue to pour in on Delphi. Tens of thousands of tips before the arrest, hundreds more after during an investigation that Carter says is still ongoing after more than five and a half years. Did you think it would take this long to get an arrest? Hmm. That's a tough question to answer. I, I, this has ebbed and flowed for me. Um, I was confident we would get an arrest, and I had hoped that it would be in um, a reason, reasonable amount of time, but that reasonable amount of time grew to be longer than I thought. Have you ever had doubts and worries that there would not be an arrest in this case? I did, but I fought it. It's haunted me. <laughs> yes, I have. And then I'd, I'd pick up the phone and I'd call one of those detectives and to say, hey, it's me. How are you doing today? And, and I'd hang up that phone and I'd think, oh, man, they don't feel that way. So I would be at peace again. Are you at peace right now? Yes. I, I see the culmination of extraordinary effort and hurt and pain in the community um, that will begin now, hopefully, begin now, hopefully to heal. But again, we're not done. We, we, are, we are not done. We're not going to leave that community until this is over. Carter says he believes more information about the actual murders, including evidence that led to Richard Allen's arrest, will be publicly released within just a matter of weeks. He says it will be both helpful and very painful because it's going to force the families and also the Delphi community to revisit the pain and trauma that they've experienced that will never go away. Folks, you know, I just thought there was so much more um, to covering this case than just, uh, you know, talking about the arrest of, uh, of Richard Allen, you know, and there's so much more we're going to learn about this case. And unfortunately, we're going to learn the very painful uh, details of this case. Painful details, in essence, the way these girls were killed. And is that, you know, is that what the the press wants? Um, is that what they want to uh, to tell their audience? Um, you know, these two beautiful girls 
murdered. And is that why they want the probable cause warrant released? Or is it just that they're entitled to it? And you heard Superintendent Carter say, yeah, eventually all of these documents are going to be released. They're not in the time frame that the press expects, but they're all going to be released. Folks, someone asked also, can they determine the height of him, of the person in this video, from the video? Can they determine? And from what I understand, uh, not being a video expert, what I understand is yes, they can. And that's um, something that they're going to, um, they, they're going to they're gonna release out there. I mean, is this, is this the killer? Is this the guy uh, arrested? Um, is this the person that is in the video? And can they tell by how tall he is um, by analyzing this video? Um, and apparently they can. They can. Um, you know, someone asked me the other day about... Uh, the FBI, uh, some of the toys, and the, the superintendent talked about the FBI's Orion, um, Orion um, computer program. And um, it's a technology that the FBI has. We, we always say in law enforcement, the FBI has all these great toys, and they really do, because they get all this federal money and uh, – they have access to things that local law enforcement doesn't have. I just want to read something. On the morning of October 3rd, 2002, four persons were murdered outside the nation's capital. It was the start of a shooting spree in a region that resulted in 10 deaths and sparked a massive hunt for the killers. The so-called Beltway snipers were caught three weeks later, but the challenges posed by the case, multiple shootings in different locations, several investigative command centers in different jurisdictions, Tens of thousands of phone and email tips streaming in, so many that at one point they had to be collected in boxes and driven to the primary command center every four hours, and difficulty sharing information with our law enforcement partners at lightning speed underscored the fact that our crisis management software systems needed an upgrade, especially in the post-9-11 area. Now we have such a tool, a next-generation system built from the ground up by investigators and technology experts. We call it Orion, the Operational Response and Investigative Online Network. Orion gives the FBI and its partners a real-time online network to quickly and efficiently coordinate efforts in crisis situations. No matter how many law enforcement personnel are involved, where they might be located, or how big the case. So, if an investigation expands from New York to Chicago to Miami, agents in every city could log into Orion and have instant access to every scrap of information on the case, says Supervisory Special Agent Mike McCoy, an investigator on the sniper case who helped design the system. So that is that program was used was used on this case. Is that amazing? It was used on this case and it helped out. In this case, so when we talk about the FBI having all this technology and having all of this, um, these great toys, we call them in law enforcement, uh, they do. And they helped a great deal in this case. And um, law enforcement uh, appreciates on these major cases, appreciates the help of the FBI. And um, especially, you know, all the uh, technology they bring to the situation. The FBI lab at Quantico, Virginia is probably one of the best in the world. You know, um, other labs have gone up to doing great jobs like that in other crime scene units. But the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia is uh, probably the best bar none in the world, in the world. So when evidence is processed, that's the gold standard of um it's the gold standard. That's all I can say, you know. Uh, uh, A2 Fleza, I can't understand how no one, at least from his family, have recognized him from the video and audio clip. He has a specific kind of walk limp, for example. Also, his silhouette and clothing. 
A2 Fleza, who says they haven't? Maybe they have. Maybe they did give him up. You know, maybe they did turn him in. We don't know. Uh, Hello, whatever. I got to see the tour version of that building with a group of kids, Quantico, Virginia, the FBI building. Wow. Amazing. Uh, it's, uh, you know, folks, I want to thank everyone for joining me today. Um, I just think so much of the information that's coming out on this case is so damn important, you know, and uh, I wanted to, uh, on a Sunday afternoon, a Sunday early evening, I wanted to cover this case and uh, and uh, bring it to you guys. From Jupiter, Florida, this is not my usual haunts, in case you haven't noticed the new backdrop. So uh, on this Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, uh, November 6th, 2022, I'm going to be signing off right now. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. God bless and uh, have a great night. One episode, just ain't enough.